Welcome back to Neuroconverse and Leadership, where we talk about effective communication and leadership in a neurodiverse world. Today with us, we have a very special guest, Dr. Ravi Iyer. He is a Harvard-trained physician, scientist, TEDx speaker, author, inventor, and there are many more things that I can't quite get into right now. Dr. Iyer, welcome. Thank you, Jeremy. It's uh, such a pleasure to be here today. Uh, uh, looking forward to con our conversation on, on neuro aligned team creations. Great. Yeah, we're looking yeah. forward to it. And one of the things we often talk about are the challenges that a lot of people in, you know, the physician and engineering and STEM fields have communicating with everyone else. But that seems like it's really a focus of yours. Can you tell us a little bit more about um, what you do and and how you do it? So I'm a physician, been a physician now for in another month or two, it will be 42 years that I've ever been a physician. I got my license in January of 1983. Um, so, but in addition to being a physician, um, I'm also uh, neurodivergent in the sense that I, uh, I have ADHD, a uh, very high functioning uh, version of autism spectrum. It'll manifest in difficulty in eye contact when I'm talking. I'll, I'll tend to, I'm much more comfortable standing on a stage and talking to groups of people rather than talking to an individual. Then I'll, I will, uh, I will talk to the person's ear rather than to a face. Um, that's uh, some a very distracting feature of mine. This one, so. Uh, people who understand spectrum disorder will recognize that I probably have spectrum in that. I have other factors, like for example, I can hyperfocus, uh, um, and I, I have a photo photographic memory. But uh, it is uh, very, very broad photo photographic memory. Uh, give you an example. I created a couple of medicines that uh, got uh, FDA approved. And when we got the FDA approval, until then I had been making these batches of medicine in my basement. When we got the FDA approval, uh, I said, oh my God, we now can't possibly do this. I gotta do a plant, you know, we can't, we can't make stuff in the basement anymore. So, so I looked around for a, a company that can, you know, manufacture it for us. So I traveled to India. I found this FDA approved facility that was manufacturing and uh, did a tour of the facility. And I asked them if I could take pictures and they said, no, no cameras allowed. I said, okay, no problem. We did a tour and at the end of the tour, um, we sat in stock, stock terms. The terms were not uh, not affordable and not, not to my liking. So I thanked them and shook hands and I walked away and came back to Virginia and built the built the factory from memory they didn't realize you had a camera in your head <laughs> yeah so so that that was very useful in medical school um, but again it is a very selective uh, high functioning uh, me uh, photographic memory uh, if the topic is mundane and it's of little interest and uh, topical interest value i won't remember it so that that obviously makes me a lousy husband because <laughs> can you can you imagine my wife for 40 years trying to think up intellectually engaging honeydew lists <laughs> which wife would want to do that <laughs> you know so i won't remember of all her honeydew lists and she has a totally different take on my capabilities if you go and ask her <laughs> well it's lasted 40 years so something's working right yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's interesting. You talked about the eye contact. And I know that when I'm having difficult conversations, sometimes it's easier to do it while walking because then you're next to the person. You're both seeing the same thing. There's movement and you, you yeah. don't have to make eye contact. Sitting across the table, it's awkward if you don't make eye contact. But Correct. if you're both moving somewhere, I think it's a great way to have important conversations. Yeah. 
That is true. And uh, one of the things uh, that I do is I force myself to make eye contact when I talk. But I, even now, I mean, I've, done, I've been working at this for 50 years and I, I will lose myself in, in a topic and then my eye contact will break. It's an ongoing uh, challenge. Uh, it's something that I'm continually working on. So, so obviously, I have the spectrum disorder uh, features, but they are very high functioning. So, unless you are very well trained, you won't pick it up, or you'll have to know me enough for sufficient period of time to detect that hey, you have certain features that are there. So, so people don't pick up on that. They'll just think of me as uh, very intelligent or very bright or whatever. But you know, leave it like at that. But uh, that basically brings me down to the thing that we chatted about shortly before we started this episode about c communication. And what I recognized is because of my challenge of keeping eye contact, I had to resort to strategies to become a very powerful, impactful, and effective communicator. So I had to leverage uh, my other skills. And one of the things that I found about communication is when I'm telling something or speaking to you right now, what you are hearing is only a part of the story. You are, there is a voice inside your head that is telling you what I am saying to you. So your, your input to your brain is coming from dual source. One, from me, and two, from your interpretation of what you got. And you synthesize these two to make your story. That is what you finally take away from the conversation. Now, once I realized this, I recognize that the efficacy of my communication is entirely dependent on my ability to connect with you in a way where you will be willing to surrender that inner voice to me. And if I can own that inner voice, then my words that I speak will resonate in your head as your words. How do you go about doing that? The essence is becoming vulnerable. When you become vulnerable, you are no longer focusing on presenting a persona to the other person. Instead, you are opening yourself up to risk. People hate being vulnerable, either in front of other people or in front of groups of people, because you need to be safe to, be open, to open yourself to injury. And when you are vulnerable, you are exposing your soft spot, you're exposing your belly. And the, our animalistic amygdala, the part of our brain, the ancient part of the brain, which is all about survival, all about the base animal instincts of procreation, anger, rage, defense, territory, all of that is in the amygdala. And our amygdala is what drives our decisions. We think that we use our neocortex. We actually use our emotions to decide and we use, we take the neocortex reasoning and then put it against the framework of our emotions and if there is a fit, then it feels right and we will do it. If there is no fit, then the emotions are, have the veto power. So our emotions is the president, while the Senate can put any bill in front of the president, the veto power is right there. Hmm. All right. So the Senate is here, but the president is right there in the amygdala. So now vulnerability is so risky for people if they don't feel safe. So when you are in communication, when you become vulnerable, by definition, you are telling the other person 
that you feel safe around that person to become vulnerable even though you may not feel safe it may be a learned behavior but when you consciously become vulnerable you are sending a message across saying that i trust you enough to show you my weakness and does that in turn get them to be open vulnerable up. yes and when you open up when two people open up then what happens is the amygdala settles down the amygdala no longer protects you then neocortex to neocortex you can talk and reason prevails and you can have discussions of an elevated nature and that's i call you know and that is the that is the more sophisticated way of describing it but i say when two people are vulnerable then communion happens and heart speaks to heart and when communion happens communication is created and when communication cre- is created then communities are born and what i say is a community is not a group of bodies occupying the same space communities is actually a group of hearts speaking the same speech i like that and that is the essence of communication so when you so when i for myself when i could no longer use because of my neurological propensity when i contact was not a reliable connection tool for me i had to resort to vulnerability and i when i became vulnerable i found that i could connect whether i was looking at the person or not that's it's a very interesting way of putting it and i yeah. think similarly i will often talk about when communicating if you ask questions and genuinely want to know the answer and you recognize and accept the emotion that they're having and once you do that i think to some degree that's similar in that you are letting them in which is making you vulnerable and that's what i always talk about is needed in order to get them to actually listen to you as well so i'll give you an example just about a week ago i was having a conversation with my wife it was a very heated conversation because i was upset about something and my wife would not let me complete my statement she wanted to fix the upset she kept trying to explain why my upsetness was not necessary it was useless it was it was a waste of my energy that i should give it up and all those things and i and until finally i just yelled at her and said that i need you to stop telling me to become okay i'll become okay on my own all i want you to do is give me the space to hear me i want to be heard will you hear me with i says yeah but you are hurting i said yeah can you suffer the pain of watching me hurt and do you have enough love in your heart to suffer the pain of watching me hurt without trying to soothe me because i can soothe myself i can't soothe myself as long as you try to soothe it for me so these are the kind of openings that are needed in even corporate worlds because people will come to you upset some breakdown has happened something that they have invested their hopes and dreams and time and energy has not turned out the way they wanted and if you are a leader you can't and especially if you care for that person if that person is a valued member of the team you will want to fix it for them if you have a connection you will want to do it by nature like if a beggar on the street is upset i'm not i don't care i don't have a relationship but if somebody i have a relationship with is upset then i will i don't want that i don't want that person's upsetness is becomes my upsetness so so but what we fail to realize is that there is a line the the other person needs to invite you to fix his life and when we 
take it upon ourselves because we think that our relationship is sufficiently deep that we can just take charge and say, I'll fix it. Then what you have done is you have infantilized that other person. You have become mom or dad and the other person has become a child. And people don't want to be a child, especially in the adult world. They may not be ready. There may be a time when they will feel like I'm so broken down. I just want to be a child. Please hug me and hurt uh, and heal me. When they do that, they have invited you to fix that, to soothe them. But until that invitation, you got to let them soothe themselves. And you, you got to be a space. And for that, you have to allow, you have, you have to allow yourself to be vulnerable. And in that, in this kind of environment, real communication happens. And when these real communications cement relationships that become a bedrock of resilience for future challenges. Because if you have one such interaction, if I have one such interaction with you, where we have impactfully interacted in this kind of deep way, then we may not see each other for six months. But then if the two of us are thrown again into a major, major upset challenge, the residue of this interaction will give us the sustaining resilience to survive the next challenge. This is, this is how you build what I call resilient teams. So rather than pushing a solution on someone, you have to wait for them to pull and ask you for help. Yeah, but you can't, I mean, you, you don't want to make it, uh, you don't want to create, uh, you know, convert a corporate meeting into a therapy session, but you know, like it's not going to go on for hours and hours. But you, you, but it is still a guided relationship. It's a guided adult relationship, and it it requires some practice. Some people have instinctively they are better at it, and some people need to be coached a little bit. But it's a, it's a eminently achievable and uh, uh, you know in the strategies of neuro aligned groups there is a you know we do these exercises where we build skills it's like bicycle riding you know you initially need training wheels or you need a steadying hand at the back of the person saying okay i'm holding it you keep biking and you know and suddenly after some time you think the person is holding on but you look around and he's standing at the street, end of the street but you know, but that, but that's the idea. You know. In every situation, you need training wheels. Can you um, define what you mean by neuro-aligned groups? So the idea of neurodiversity is not new. ADHD, in the medical literature, as far back as 1775, there have been yes, uh, the German I mean, German um, doctors uh, published papers in 1775 describing individuals with um, high distractibility, difficulty in attention, and uh, hyperactivity. Classic ADHD was described in 1775, but it was not until 1998 when you know Singer Judy Singer. Uh, came out with the idea of neurodiversity, she coined it as a term. And uh, the, so the idea that neurodiversity is something intrinsic to the neurological makeup of the human mind allowed for an integration of neurocognitive range that ranged from our so-called neurotypical versus neurodiverse. They are not separate. They are just like light. They are on a spectrum. And so because historically neurodiverse conditions have been looked upon as medical disorders, so there's always a deficit disorder abnormality label. They were not seen as a continuum of neurological function. So, and also because the monetization of medicine, business model of medicine required something to be a problem for it to be paid for, for the fixing of it or the treatment of it to be paid for. 
So therefore, everything had to have a medical disease diagnosis. If you went to an insurance company and said, well, this is just a normal variation of a human spectrum, they'll say, okay, thank you very much. We're not going to pay for it. So as a result, the the uh, conversation on around neurodiversity is still rooted in a deficit abnormality discussion. And... Uh, and because of that, the approach to handling neurodiversity has been one borrowed from the disability field of accommodations. Now, I would not accommodate someone if I just thought that this guy is good in math and this guy is good in writing advertising copy. I would not consider these two people as requiring accommodations for their work just because that was their skill set. I would consider it a skill set that you are a good ad copy and you are a good mathematician. So you, I'm going to put you in the finance section. You, I'm going to put you in the marketing and division section, right? Right. But but that's not what we do here. We don't take a neurodiverse and uh, autistic spectrum person and say that, hey, you are so good at pattern recognition. I'm going to put you in code analysis. No, you, you tell them, no, I think you, since you can't show up to work within the hours of nine to five and present a report like this, so I had to accommodate you. So l let me segue a little bit. So uh, this whole, this whole business of DEI, diversity, equity, inclusion, has lost itself in the forest swamps and weeds of race, color, gender, and sexuality, or sexual orientation. For me, as an employer, what do I care how my employees look like, dress like, or love like? All I care is that they can all work together, all right? So, neuroalignment is a more gender, race, and color neutral it is neuro, neurocognitively neutral and it is affirming rather than accommodating. So I, I coined the, book, the word neuroalignment to remove the debris of all these moralistic labeling that was going on and get people focused on the task of the real business at hand. You have people, 20% of the workforce, 20% of the global population, and by extension, the workforce is neurodiverse. So now, you can't have one-fifth of your employees <laughs> just checking out because you don't know how to fix it, to, to use them. So the, the whole idea of the cognitive alignment workshop or the Kogal workshop or this strong course is to help team leaders and managers change their orientation towards creating neurocognitive niches, like an ecological niche, and allowing a company's team structure to have neurocognitive diversity, just like ecological diversity. So the analogy I use is the rainforest. What if a company had a rainforest of mines where you had low fungi, but th that fungi is secreting a valuable antibiotic chemical into the soil that protects the roots of this huge tree that goes all the way 200 feet into the canopy. And that 200 foot canopy tree is providing a, an ec ecosystem for a whole range of diversity. So that's what I call of, of a neuro-aligned group. And you create a system where you allow all parts to be part of a whole and all parts to be validated as a whole rather than differentiating this part as superior or inferior. It's a very enlightened way of doing business. And it requires to be taught because it has not been the way or the modus operandi of the last 200 years. So you can't change the thinking of 200 years like that. It has to be taught one-on-ones in session by session and people are going to try it 
they are going to get it right and then they'll fall out and they'll have to come back and, you know but but it's still a it is still an enterprise worth uh, having and an engagement worth doing i love it i you are saying all the things that i say just a little bit better <laughs> so thank you for that it and it really does teams that are willing to embrace differences are just so much stronger and there are so many studies that show it rather than just having everybody with the same skill set the thing that distinguishes my approach is that i nothing i have said when i say these things everyone resonates with it because they have heard it in different languages in different words and different settings my unique a USP, as they call it, unique selling proposition. I don't, I don't like that word that much. I don't, because I'm not, I'm not trying to sell anything. I'm, I'm actually proposing. I'm giving a proposition here. My proposition or unique proposition is, I, because of my capacity as a physician, number one, and two, because of my own neurological makeup as an AUDHD person. I bring a, a, an incomparable perspective that does not exist in me. And this I blend with my ability of insight and my, I, my, my 42 years of working one-on-one -on -one with people, one person at a time, helping them transcend their circumstances in diverse scenarios. So in such a way, I, the courses that I conduct are far more dynamic and richer because of that. That's fantastic. Where can people go to learn more about you and the courses that you offer? Oh, just come to my website. It's still a, pro a work in progress, my website, because I'm, so many things are happening. Um, I just published my second book, so my website has to change because of that. Uh, I'm working now on my third and fourth book. The third and fourth book is actually going to come out in February or maybe by March. Uh, and that is entirely on the neurological, neurodiversity. The third book is called um, Squirrels in My Mind convert the neurodiverse superpowers into neuro-aligned super teams. And the second, the fourth, the, the fourth book is Acorns of Wisdom, the Squirrel's Comprehensive Workbook for, uh, Squirrel's Comprehensive Workbook for team leaders uh, and managers. So, I love it. Yeah. I am going to put a link to your web page uh, in the show notes so people can, can reach out and learn more. And in the interest of time, we have to get going, but I always love to ask these three questions. The first is, where is a place you've traveled and loved? And then part B is a place you have not yet been but want to go. So the, I really loved, we just went in September. My wife and I, we went to Vienna and Salzburg in Austria and that was the best highlight of our Europe trip. We went to other places, but I, I could not get over here in Salzburg. Um, the place I have not gone um, is, I would like to go to a place like Bora Bora or, or the one of the Tahitian islands. So. I've not been either, but it's definitely on my list. Yeah. Who do you think is a great communicator, whether famous person or just someone in your family? Martin Luther King always is my number one choice on communication. Everyone recognizes him for his inspiring, um, soul-stirring uh, public speeches, but you know, I have a dream being the, one of the best known. But Martin Luther King exemplifies the art of connection. Because when he speaks, you know, I have a dream, a hundred thousand hearts resonated with that, I have a dream. So that is the essence of communication, where suddenly in front of him on, on that Lincoln Memorial stage, you know, a hundred thousand people were one, just one, one voice. And that brings goosebumps, whether you hear it on just as a 
audio track or you see it in a black and white video it still gives me goosebumps every time i listen to that nice that's a good one and final question is what is one piece of communication advice that we can all benefit from dig deep within yourself open yourself up every time you talk open yourself up the soul of our beings cannot lie the soul of our beings always speaks truth there is no uh, falsehood there is no dissembling there is no masks there, there are no nothing no smoke and mirrors there so when you open up everything that comes out always rings true and it always strikes the target i love it so open up and communicate those are cool. fantastic dr ayer i want to thank you so much for being here with us today it's been a pleasure thank you thank you so much for listening to another episode of neuroconversant leadership i hope you're entertained while also learning a thing or two did this episode remind you of anyone Do you think that person might appreciate this podcast? If so, please send them to my website, www.neuroconversantleadership.com, where they can listen to the episodes or send them a link to whatever platform it is that you're listening to this on. Thanks again and have a great week.